Go ahead. All right. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. And I hope <coughs> you will appreciate this also. First of all, a few words about me. As he said, my name is Nicola Oberly. My nick is Balda. I work as a security engineer at SCRT, a security company in the French part of Switzerland. I do a lot of CTFs with the Team Zero Day Sober. I also love to play old video games on different kind of machines, and I love to drink beer and I also brew them myself. So, how did I get there? A few years ago, I started building an old arcade machine using a desktop computer and some emulators so I can play some video games, some old video games with friends, etc. And I was thinking about adding the possibility to insert coins to actually add new credits to, to play the game. So I'm not that greedy, but yeah, getting some money from friends is always fun. So when we talk about coin handling devices, <coughs> you, if you try to, to look at, there are a lot of machines that accept money, bills, or that return the money. If you look all around, there are vending machines for drinks, for cigarettes. If you buy train tickets also, they are in the casino. Many machines that do this. And there are multiple devices that are used to actually uh, see if you're putting one Swiss franc, two Swiss francs, or if you try to insert a euro, or maybe false coins. And some of these devices are, for example, coin and bill acceptors. These devices obviously need uh, detect the coin you insert and can send to the device uh, the correct value, and hopefully you will have more credits in the machine to play, to buy cigarettes, etc can also detect false coins, and for some of them, it can detect multiple kinds of money, like euros, dollars, Swiss francs, etc. Other devices include coin sorters. They are used to sort coins in different trays. For example, if in the machine there are trays for uh, one Swiss francs or two Swiss francs, this device, when the coin is dropped, can switch in different trays the money, so we can sort the money in different areas to be, maybe, uh, maybe it's easier for it to actually get the money back for the, the vendor. Another kind of machine is what is called a coin hopper. It's kind of a tray that is able to give the money back to the user. So there's a lot of money in the tray, and once commanded to, the hopper can give back one coin uh, at a time. This is normally used to uh, give you the, the money change or something like this. So in those devices, there are many m communication protocols that can be used. There are parallel, serial, and two other protocols called MDB and CC Talk. Those protocols are normally vendor specific, so each vendor does use a special kind of one of these protocols. And since the coin acceptor I bought for my project was doing CC talk, that's what we are talking about today. What is CC talk? CC talk stands for coin control talk. It's a semi proprietary protocol. Semi in the meaning that if you go to cctalk.org, you can download some of the specs. Some of them are freely available. Some of the other specs are only available after signing an NDA. That's not cool, but could, be could help to really implement all the functionalities of the device we see before. CCTalk works in a way that normally there's a controller, the main board of the vending machine, that sends requests to the devices, and the devices just respond to those requests. There's no uh, TCP-like connections or something. It's just a request and a response, that's all. It works pretty much like a serial line, so it's 9.6 qubit seconds, but it uses TTL signals, so it's between 0 and 5 volts. And one thing that is 
quite strange, it's, it's only used one physical wire for both sending and receiving. So you only have one wire to send and receive your data. You do it on the same wire. That's quite strange. It uses addresses for all the devices on the bus. By default, address number one is the controller, the main board. Number two is the default address for a coin acceptor. Number three is the default for a coin hopper. And there is a special address that is zero. It's for a broadcast message. So we can send a request that is accepted by all the devices on the bus. All frames use the same format. This is the format of one CC talk message. There's always one byte for the destination address, one byte for the data length, one byte for the source address, one byte for the header. The header is the actual command sent to the device. So whatever header it is, it's the different, the different functions the controller sends to the device to perform different actions. And then you have a variable length of data and a checksum. The payload length, the data length, the second byte of the packet can vary from 0 to 252. So the maximal size of the packet is 256 bytes. The checksum is only the complement to 255 of the whole data. So it's pretty easy to compile the checksum. As I said, there are a lot of headers. Since it's coded in a byte, there are 256 possible commands. And from the documentation, you have a whole list. That's a screenshot of the documentation there with all the headers and their corresponding function. There are new headers added in new versions of the protocol. And there are headers that are reserved or for internal use only. There may be some things to check with these. To have a look, there's a sample communication. We can see this first request there. It's from the header in green. It's a sample poll, kind of a ping, from device at address 01, the controller, to a device at address 02. It gets a response, header 00, from device at address 2 to device at address 1. There's no data in both of them. And if you look at this, there's a real strange thing. Real, this will cause some problems to, to actually see, sniff the data. In the response, you don't have any way, any relation between the response and the request. The response is always zero. So you have to know the request to know to the response what is the corresponding response. Since normally there's only one controller, so it will send the request receive the response, then send another request, maybe on another device, and, and get the response. But if you are just connecting to the bus, you have no way to know which, uh, which was the request for this response. This might be a problem for the future. Another packet sent. <coughs> the header is F6, request manufacturer ID, again from the controller to the device. And the device responds with a length of three, and the response is NRI. It's the manufacturer of this coin acceptor. The payload is ASCII encoded. There are other responses that are binary encoded. It really depends on the device or the specs. So <coughs> for my initial project, I was able to ping the, uh, the device. I was able to get some information for it, but now I need to know exactly how to get if somebody puts one Swiss francs or another coin in the device. To do this, there's a header, number 229, that is sent to the device. And the device sends back 11 bytes of data. That is one byte for a counter and five results that are uh, of two bytes length. This counter is incremented by each event that is made on the coin acceptor. So each time you put a coin in it, even if it's a wrong coin, a false coin, uh, a good coin, or if there's a problem, there will be a new event generated and the counter will be incremented. The last five results are 
encoded in two bytes. Normally, in the first byte, there's the validation channel. There's, this, is not the, this is not the value of the coin inserted, it's the validation channel. If you like, it's the ID of the recognitionized, recognitionized piece uh, coin. Normally, a coin acceptor device can recognize up to 16 different kinds of coins, and each of them is assigned a validation channel, so from 1 to 16. Normally, they are set by the manufacturer by default, but you can also reconfigure it to, for example, if you have one in euro format, you can change and make, uh, make the coin acceptor recognize Swiss coins or something. The second byte contains normally the error code. So if it's a bad coin, if the coin was correctly accepted, if there's a mechanical error, etc. And it can also contain the channel where <coughs> the, the coin has been placed to. This, using this coin sorter, the cost center, again, place the, uh, place the coin in different trays and you will get this information using the result B. The problem is that sometimes result B are switched. So for some vendors of coin acceptors, the result, the first byte contains the error code and the second one contains the, the actual value, the actual channel. So you have to look at the data sheet to be sure on how your coin acceptor works. So I have all information to create my initial project. So I implemented the CCTOC protocol on a TNC device. For those who don't know who this is, it's kind of like an Arduino. Just look at your badge. But the advantage of the TNC is that it can emulate USB devices like a mouse, a serial port, or what is interesting for me, a keyboard. <coughs> so what I did is simply implement the, pro the CCTOC protocol to pull a coin acceptor device and since it, uh, since it shows uh, one Swiss francs has been inserted, it will send a keystroke to my main cab and add a new credit. If you want to have a look, the TNC is right there, a big mess of wires, You're mostly for debugging purposes. There's a game running behind and the coin acceptor. If I put one Swiss francs, I will have one credit. If I put two Swiss francs, two more credits. If I do it again, it counts to five. So great. <coughs> now I was able to get some money, more. But since I'm a hacker, uh, it's uh, telling me, but yeah, but can we do more things? Can we get more information or, yeah, there might be more things to do with, the, with this protocol. So I had a look and found several different devices or vending machines that use CC Talk. And I was trying to maybe interpret the data or at least know exactly how this, is, uh, how this works in real life situations, not that kind of hack that, that I did. The problem is that there is no open source CC Talk sniffer for the moment. <coughs> so I created two tools that, call, that are called CC Sniff and CC Parse. They are coded in Python. And CC Sniff is obviously used to sniff data on a bus and uh, save data on a, on a file. And CC Parse is a tool to actually pass the data to a readable format so you can track the request and responses and see exactly how it works. I had to create a CC Talk library because, again, there are no open source tools to do that. And the best use case you could do is to use a bus pirate to sniff the data on the bus. Why a bus pirate? Because you have on your laptop maybe uh, a serial line. The problem is that there's no, uh, they are not in the same voltage as the CC Talk bus. So this is a bus pirate. It's an open source hardware hacking tool. It's really easy to interface this with all kinds of protocols, UART, SPI, I2C, one wire, etc., etc. You can use it using a terminal, or you can also script it for tools like the one I did. 
So for a quick demo, CCSniff takes for arguments the serial device, and we select an output file in temp, and we see there the data that is traveling on the bus. If with this data <coughs> we're using CC parse, there's a nice console interface where you see all the packets, you can select them, and if you press enter, we'll get all the information of the packet, what is the correct name of the header, not only the number. <coughs> if it's a response, you can decode it, and you can that way track what is happening directly on the bus. We see there the response of a header 229, the one used to get information for a coin sorter, a coin acceptor, sorry. And you have the decoded payload with the event counter and all the five results in the two bytes and also a dump, an X dump of the packet. So with these tools, it's really easy to sniff, uh, sniff a CC talk bus and understand and learn on how does it work exactly. I'm still a hacker and I said to me, can we do maybe even more? <coughs> because we are on the bus, we can listen to the traffic, but are we able to inject data or write data on this bus? Like for example, telling, okay, I'm the coin acceptor and I received two, uh, two more francs, two more francs again, two more, two more, two more, to get more credits for buying cigarettes or something. The problem is that, again, there's only one physical wire for the bus. So if we can sniff the request, we will also, uh, the corresponding device will also do. And normally the corresponding device will respond to the controller before or at the same time as us. And this will jam the signal and raise an error, fire up an alarm or something. So how can we make it to disable the the correct device, the, the target device, to respond at its place. What? Okay. So I looked again at the documentation and I found some commands called multi-drop commands that are used by a controller to resolve conflicts. For example, if you have many coin acceptors for different kind of money, by default they will all have the address number two. So the, the controller can send a command to one of the devices to tell him to change its address to a new one. Either the controller can uh, specify one address or he can use another header, the header 250, that is address random. So when using address random, the device will try to sniff the, uh, the bus and use a new address that is not in use at the, at the moment. So with these requests, we may be able to Display, uh, to change a device address and start acting like we actually are the device. To do this, just send uh, address cha an address change request and change the target to another address somewhere on the bus. And since it won't respond again to the request, we are now able to respond at its place. So we are directly hijacking the device. We can maybe forward the request to the device or respond instead of the hijacked device. Again, the problem is that there's only one wire, <coughs> so we have to be sure that we won't jam the traffic. I could be able to do some tests on real vending machines, and I even found one that when there was a jam or there was some kind of interruption, it was starting uh, screaming with an alarm. It was crazy. <coughs> so. I did some calculus, and to send the address change request, it takes about five, uh, six milliseconds. And as the specs said, you need to poll every device every 200 milliseconds. So normally there's largely enough time for us, but the problem is that the more device you have on the bus, the shorter the, uh, the silence window will be available. Because you have to poll every device every 200 milliseconds, but if you have five devices, you have to pull them every 200 milliseconds, but one at a time. So it's 200 milliseconds of silence divided by five. So the more device, the shorter the window. 
To sum it up, <coughs> if you want to hijack a device on the bus, you have to scan the bus to actually look if there's enough silence to inject data. If there's sufficient periods of silence, <coughs> you can prepare the injection, so look at the device you want to hijack, prepare an address that is not in use at the moment, then wait for a silence period, <coughs> inject the packet so the device will change its address, and then at, the, at this moment, we can start responding instead of the, the target device. After we finished, to be clean, we need to <coughs> take the device and tell him to get its original address, so we'll stay stealth, and normally there won't be any alarm firing up or something. Again, we need to do this while the bus is in use, so we, we cannot just send all the packets and start responding, we have to check if there are not other devices that <coughs> maybe are jamming the traffic or are responding, uh, at, are responding sorry, uh, ahead of us. So, to simplify this, <coughs> I created a tool called CCJack <coughs> that automates the hijacking process. <coughs> and it works by <coughs> sniffing the bus, looking for data, and finding uh, silence windows, preparing the, the injection, change the device address, and start responding as the device we, we want to hijack. Again, we are using a bus pirate to sniff, and it can, since it can also inject traffic, that's the perfect tool to interact with, with the bus physically. <coughs> as an example, <coughs> that's the title of the, this talk, we're able to inject some kinds. <coughs> like, if you hijack a con acceptor, you are able to respond to, any, uh, to every request, like the one we saw, we saw previously, and just respond by incrementing the event counter. Every time you increment the, the event counter, the last event will be replayed, and if you just put one Swiss franc, one Swiss franc, for example, if you increment the counter, the machine will actually think there's new, one new franc inserted, etc., etc., etc. If you want to do this, you have to be really careful <coughs> not to <coughs> set um, an event counter lower than the previous value, because in that case, the main board will start again an alarm. There are some protections that are made for, by the vendors to protect hijacking, but normally, <coughs> if you do this correctly, like sniffing the bus to see what are the last response from the device, and right after hijacking, send the same response before starting modifying them, normally you won't get any problem. To see how it works, again, I have MAME there, so I'm still using my project for this. And with CCJack, <coughs> I use the same parameters as CCSniff. The only difference is that we need to specify a source address, so the actual target address, and a destination address, the where we, we are going to send the, the device on the bus. So we specify the coin acceptor at device 2 and send him to address 7. And when it's done, we see there the response that, uh, that has been sniffed by CCJack. And if we modify it, it would have two more credits. If we do it again by incrementing by 1 the event counter, we'll again add new credits. And now, <coughs> if I tell him to increment automatically in the machine, we'll start getting more and more and more and more and more credit. Okay, that's great, but <coughs> maybe we can do even more with this. <coughs> like, as, for example, an acceptor is offline, is not responding to anything, so we can do pretty much whatever we want with it. For example, some kind acceptor are able to be reprogrammed by CC Talk, so we can <coughs> send a header to, to tell him, just switch in learn mode, and you can say, okay, reprogram the channel number five, for example. So, <coughs> the coin acceptor will ask for some coins, new coins, and it will start learning about the, the diameter, the, the weight, etc., to <coughs> learn for a new coin. For example, let's say 
since the main board actually only knows the channel ID of a coin, it has to have uh, a corresponding table between the channel ID and the actual value of the money. So this table is in the coin acceptor and in the main board. So, for example, if uh, five Swiss francs, the, co the big coin, five Swiss francs in, is in the channel ID number five, if we reprogram the channel ID number five with 10 cents coins <coughs> and <coughs> move back the, the device to its original address, when putting 10 cents, the coin acceptor will send there's a new coin with channel ID number five and the main board will check, okay, channel ID number five, it's, oh, it's five francs, great. So uh, let's have five francs in the credit. But you only have put 10 cents. <coughs> That's pretty easy to do. On other devices, you also can change the path the coin takes after being accepted. Like we saw, we have a, a coin, sor uh, coin sorters that can place money in different trays, and there's always one tray for bad credit or bad money that is sent back to the user. So why can't we, uh, can't we change <coughs> the sorter path from normally getting in the tray, but getting back to the user? So we just put five francs, it gets back, and it gets counted. So since you win, just play again. No problem. That's cool. <coughs> On another topic <coughs> for the hoppers, they normally use a special schema to release the money. It's kind of protected. You have to ask for a challenge. It will send you back eight random bytes. Then the controller needs to encode this challenge with the number of coins to actually send back. And send this value to the hopper, and if the challenge and the response match, it will start <coughs> giving out the money. The problem is that, <coughs> to simplify these steps, because the algorithm is only available when signing an NDA, so I think even, the, even some <coughs> vendors do not have to, to sign the NDA, and to be more simple, <coughs> they're not, they are not using this kind of uh, challenge response thing, but only <coughs> use the serial number. So instead of uh, the, the response encoded with the challenge, you only have to send as, it, as, the, as the response the serial number of the, the device. And <coughs> by looking at the documentation of some hoppers, I also find <coughs> this phrase. If the hopper product code is blah, 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 then the dispense card command still needs an 8-byte code, but the value of the code does not matter. So yeah, just send whatever you want, dead beef, eight times, and that's it, you have the money. <coughs> so if <coughs> the hopper does <coughs> not use <coughs> any kind of challenge response, or you can put whatever you want, just tell him to dispense 255 coins. You will clear it, but you have to do this challenge response thing, even if the, the response is not correct. There's another way, much better. There's a command called purge hopper, and you just send it, and the hopper will start clearing itself, dropping all the money. Why use encryption or challenge response if you have this command? I don't know. OK, so we found many things to do, but isn't there any protection? Yeah, in the, in the specs there are protection, like a pin code, a four-digit pin code that needs to be sent by the controller to the device before actually sending commands. It's only for a subset of commands, and it depends on the device. For example, for a coin acceptor, you are only able to probe for new events after sending the pin code. The problem is that the pin code is sent in clear text on the CC talk bus. So if you sniff, you will get the pin, and you can just send this, uh, send this pin to, to get the information you want. The actual command for the pin code is header 218, so just look for it. Normally, you only have to do it once, and the device will be in unlocked mode and respond to every command from the, from the controller. But if you really want the, the pin code, just pull out the power code of the vending machine, pull it back, and since it will be a reset, you will be able to get this pin code. Since, uh, since it's in clear text, there's no problem for that. In later versions of the specs, there's also encryption. 
There are at the moment two encryption methods, a proprietary encryption with obviously no details, you have to sign this NDA, with a 24-bit key, and death encryption using <coughs> a 56-bit key. And there's also for a new version that should be coming in 200 and 2013, a version with AAS. All of these use a pre-shared key between the controller and the devices, and <coughs> the encryption uses different headers. For example, we normally use the header 229 to request data from, the, from a con acceptor, and the controller now must use uh, header 112 to read encrypted events that is encrypted with this key. The problem is that if you really want to know this value, you just have to send the header with the header 229. Even it's <coughs> it's if it's encryption enabled, you are able to send this command and get the data unencrypted. There's no disabling. <coughs> the, the clear text uh, header is not disabled when using encryption. So if you really uh, want this information, you are still able to have it. That's great. So we have more things to, to discover for this protocol. For example, the encryption support. There are maybe more things to do. For example, the keys can be transferred using CC Talk. So the desk key or the proprietary key is normally transferred using CC Talk at the initialization of the device. And since it's a proprietary and closed source encryption, it could be weak. It should be weak because, yeah, in such a small device, you won't have any crypto device or something like this, so <coughs> normally the proprietary encryption could be easily breakable. There's also a possibility to dump the internal memory on, of all the devices on a CCTalk bus. Just send a command and we'll s it, will, it will send you back all the memory pages it has. So maybe you can get information, find vulnerabilities in the firmware, or <coughs> get private data. It is also possible to upload a new firmware to the device while it's in use. <coughs> so why not preparing a new firmware with new money configuration and just upload it to the device? And that will be great. For the hoppers, <coughs> since not all the devices, there are actually some good devices that actually use the challenge response protocol, there are maybe also two things to do with this. I'm still working on this, <coughs> so there may be a new version or a new tool to crack the key or to break the, uh, the challenge response algorithm. I'm still reversing an application. Maybe I will sp uh, speak about this later. <coughs> and that's pretty much it for this. A few words about the connectivity. Normally these vending machines are locked you are not able to directly connect to this bus. For the, uh, the machines I've checked, normally there are two keys. There are one key for the, <coughs> the technician that is able to open the machine, fill it up for, uh, of cigarettes, for example, or to, uh, to replace a broken device. And another key for the actual owner of the, of the, the vending machine that needs a second key to actually get the money. The problem is that Access to the, the CC talk bus normally only requires the machine to be open because all the con acceptor devices are normally right in the door. So you have all the cables, you can just connect to it using this. So nearly everyone can do this. For example, an evil employee, or if you see a machine open, wide open, just connect to it and start hacking. <coughs> At the moment, we need to have our laptop, a bus pirate, connect to this bus, etc. So, yeah, you will normally be easily spotted in a casino if you are with your laptop on an open machine to actually try to hack some stuff. <coughs> that may be difficult. The thing is, <coughs> and that's another project, it would be possible to use an Arduino, for example. That may be a cool thing to do there. And use a Bluetooth shield, so a Bluetooth interface for the, the Arduino, and do exactly the same, inject traffic, inject money, etc., etc., using Bluetooth. So if you're able to find a machine, or, uh, an open machine, just connect it, close the machine, walk away, come back later, and with your phone, 
just inject the traffic and add money, for example. That would be possible. In conclusion, <coughs> specific protocols are really fun to analyze. There are several funny things I found. I didn't know there was those kind of protocols, like CC Talk. I didn't even know about this before buying actually uh, one coin acceptor. There's still more work to do with this. Again, since it's money related, there's always <coughs> interest for this for hackers. So. If you don't have it, also buy a bus pirate and start hacking C stock. Just a word about the tools. <coughs> All of them will be available just after RJs. Check out my GitHub account. I will push the application, let's say, on Monday. And that's it. Thank you very much. <coughs>